All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to talk a lot today about one of the strangest things to me when it comes to the Mandela Effect. Yeah, there's something stranger. The Bible always seemed out of place to me. We know there's Bible Mandela Effects, but in comparison to everything else, it just seems kind of like its own category. It seems just out of place. And I, I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else. Maybe it's just the way I categorize them in my head. I see a couple of you nodding. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm not as crazy as I sound in my own head. Uh, or maybe I am. You don't know. <laughs> but, um, but it's always seemed different than the rest of the men. It, like I said, it's its own category. It's got its own list of Mandela effects specifically geared toward the Bible. And before we get into this, and I may steal one of your points, I don't know, I apologize if I do. Uh, but before I bring John on, I do want to make one more point. And that is, people tell me the Bible can't change, it's the Word of God. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, can anybody show me where God himself come down and wrote a word down? Anybody? Show of hands. I'd like to note there's no hands up in the room. Okay, so that's my point. God's word probably can't change. We don't know. God ain't give us any evidence of him writing anything down. So we'll test that when we get the chance. The, Bible's not, the Bible is man's writing inspired by God. That's not God's word. God's word, again, would be God writing down a word. That's my opinion. Perhaps I'm wrong. That's not the opinion of everybody in IMEC. I can say that. That is my opinion. Uh, but with that said... Ladies and gentlemen, we have somebody coming to the stage who's been really, really bothered by the Bible effects, more so than me, apparently. Uh, John Kerwin has served in full and part-time ministries as a worship leader and pastor for over 30 years. He is the founder of Wake Up or Else, a 508C1 online Christian fellowship. I love this. I was speaking to him about his name the other day. Uh, wake up or else. It's a Christian fellowship. <laughs> I love it, buddy. It's amazing. Uh, for the truther community. With close to 5,000 subscribers and over 100,000 hours of view, Wake Up or Else PMA has hit, been providing insights into the truther's journey since 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and pleasure to bring up to the stage right now, wake up or else himself, John Kerwood. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. All right, can you all hear me okay? <clears throat> and can I get the PowerPoint up? Oh, that's okay. <clears throat> How do you cram seven years of a journey into 45 minutes? First of all, hi. Where have you all been all my life? I mean, you guys are like family to me. This is so difficult, what we're going through. All of us are on this journey of discovery, but those of us around us may be not on the same journey. How many of you have had that experience? All right, and so we run this into this gauntlet this juggernaut of rejection and isolation and being misunderstood. And, and so in my, um, no, that's okay, you're fine. Uh, I have interacted with tens of thousands of people, but I personally corresponded with over 200 people that have been divorced by their spouse because they found out any number of truths, moon landing fake, chemtrails, Draco's, what we're talking about, name it. It's just outside of officialdom, divorced. I was divorced by my beautiful wife, who I still haven't talked with. But a month ago, I begged her. I said, honey, I love you. This is madness. I don't want to, I want to grow old with you, right? And she said, I don't want to be married to you. We're in two different worlds. So how many of you have those in your life who you feel, they feel that you're in two different worlds, right? So. This has been my, my ministry to this truther community that are on this journey to how do you manage this emotional rejection and all that. So that's what Wake Up or Else is about. But then what Jerry mentioned is so true. This event can't be sloughed off like it's no biggie. But then when you realize that the, the centerpiece book of this religion, Christianity, is also part of the things that are changing, I'm, I'm here to tell you that as Christians, we really 
value the Bible, right? It's really important to us. And, and here it is being fiddled with. And so my challenge is to try to minister to those that are, in, that are knowers, they know, but then also to try to reach out to those that don't know, okay? And so I came here from Charlotte to learn from all of those who are speaking, but also to test the theory that I've come to. So I'm gonna, this is gonna be participatory. Is that a word? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I'm gonna ask you to take the other side of my argument, because all of you can probably relate to this. We're trying to convince people that what we're experiencing is not just misremembering. Has anybody had that conversation? Okay. So we're, we're attempting to, to try to establish our credibility because typically what happens is we're being told we're crazy, right? You're, or you're misremembering, or it's false beliefs, like Cynthia showed us. All the, all the mainstream media, you're false beliefs. No, they're not. They're true beliefs. It's just I'm in a different timeline now, or I'm in a different consciousness, or I went to a different universe. Whatever it is, we, we don't really know, I would say. But what we do know is we know what it isn't. It isn't misremembering. And so my journey has been to try to figure out how to convince those that don't see it as we do, because to me, that is very important, that I'm able to win people to my way of thinking. We do that in sales, we do it in our relationships. Now I know in, in this room, the enlightenment is so high, it's like off the charts of, of the consciousness that people are walking in. But what I'm gonna ask you to do is step it down a little bit for the average person that isn't where you are, okay? The Bible speaks that, it says we should condescend to the lowly. So I'm gonna ask you in our process to condescend to those normies. Not only do they not know this is happening, you know, they don't understand quantum physics and all of these concepts that we are trafficking in. And so um, I began to try to figure out how to talk to these people. And what all of us have done this. It's called, uh, I call it the shock and awe approach. Well, surely if I give them enough examples, then they'll believe me, right? Shock and awe. 20 examples. How many of you tried that and it didn't work? Okay, so I started to ask God, I said, well, God, why? It's not that they don't see, by the way. They all have the same memories we do. Ask 100 people, who, what did the witch say when she was in front of the mirror? Blank, blank on the wall. They'll all go, what? Mirror. They all say it. So they're experiencing the same thing we are, right? So it's not that they don't see. Jesus said, they have eyes, but they perceive not. So it's not that they don't have the same experience. All of humanity is experiencing the Mandela effect, but they then draw a different conclusion than us, okay? So what conclusion do they draw? And this is, this is where the entire debate rests. It rests in, is this a naturalistic experience or is it a supernatural, unexplainable experience? Now there may be, like uh, uh, Tom, was it the first speaker? There may be underlying scientific explanations for what we're experiencing, so ultimately the phenomenon isn't a phenomenon. You follow me? But at this point, it's still a phenomenon. Okay, it isn't misremembering. It, it, what they're trying to tell us is, oh, they're like this. Oh, John, I could clear this up. You're just confusing the platter's peanut guy with the Monopoly guy, right? So what is, what is he saying? You're just befuddled. <laughs> You just, you just bounce, you're bu you know, bumping into walls and you can't remember the <laughs> times tables. That's what they're telling us. Is that right? Yeah. And what are you saying? No, no, no. No, that's not what's happening, right? Well, that's very frustrating and it's counterproductive. It's not working. So I started to ask guys, you know, why do they come to that conclusion? Well, what's the answer? They don't know and they don't want to know. Okay, so then I said, well, why don't they want to know? Well, there's all kinds of reasons for that one, okay? One of them is they don't want their happy life disturbed. Okay, now, uh, uh, truthers are truthers for one reason. They have integrity. Congratulations! You all have integrity. Because what happens is you have a conscience that's given to you by God. You have a devil on one shoulder, angel on the other. All of us have it. We, you don't have to tell little Billy, Billy, don't touch the stove. Right? Billy knows right and wrong already, okay? 
So what happens is when you find out, let's use the moon landing as an archetype of any conspiracy theory that's outside of the Oberton window, okay? It's outside of the norm. When you see that it's fake, your conscience tells you that's wrong, right? They're lying. Lying is wrong, right? Well, at least, okay, let me, let me back up. I have to lay some, some foundation here. I'm coming from a biblical worldview. Okay. Now, I sat in the back last night, and I, and I came here. I'm taking notes. I came to learn from people that have a different worldview than I do. I don't reject you. I would love to have a meal with Chris or Cynthia or any, and I had breakfast with Tat this morning. Did we not have a lusty debate over breakfast? You should have recorded. It was boom. We were saying that we should record this. Okay, so I don't hold you in derision because you have a different worldview than mine. I'm a moralist. My truth is that there are absolutes. The Ten Commandments are not the Ten Suggestions. I believe you're born into God's universe, not your universe. People in the jungle worship a totem pole. They got a cow, a crow, a fox, and a snake, and they make up their own God. I believe that the Bible was given to us so that we can know this eternal God, and I choose to believe it or not. And so essentially what I'm saying is, if you reject the, the Bible story, then either you're right and I'm wrong, or I'm right and you're wrong, and I know this cuts right down the middle of the quantum reality, which is there's, everything is probabilities, right? However, uh, I actually came and asked the question about absolutes within the context of this, where is the young lady looking down and seeing an apple and I'm seeing an egg? Okay, in the same room, we're sharing a reality. So, for instance, right now, we just became aware of a flip-flop. We all know what that is, right? Okay, so, Mark, do you have your Bible with you? Mark turned me on to this uh, today. All right, so, in 2 Peter 2, my Bible says Noah, and in the same Bible, Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, it says Noe. Okay, so what happened was... Uh, this is going to be slide 48. Mark, come on up and, and bring your Bible with you and just show everybody. Get the same passage and let, let them see and hand up, just pass both Bibles around. So flip-flops, in case you're not aware, is where something changes, like Chuck E. Cheese's change. Chuck E. Cheese change of Chuck E. Cheese's. These are uh, some of the flip-flops. And then... Uh, Tidy cats changed to tidy cat. And then, um, okay, I'm just going to go to my thing. 48 is where I want to go. 48. Okay, and here it is. Okay, so these are all biblical names that changed, we believe, because of the Mandel effect. And all of a sudden, Jeremiah is now showing up as Jeremy in the Bible. Noah is Noe, Asher is Aser, Hosea is Osi, Nebuchadnezzar is Nebuchadnezzar, Shem is Sam, Gideon, Gideon, Nephili is Nephilim, John the Baptist now is John Baptist, in your Bibles. And so what do we do? We go to the unconvinced and we ask the pastor, why is this? And their explanation is, well, um, when they transliterate it from the original language, John, they, they have it like this, because that's the transliteration. Okay, well now, in this moment, in this reality, what I have in my Bible, in the book of Matthew, my Bible says Noah, and in the book of Second Peter, the same Bible says Noe. Well, if you're transliterating it from the original and it should be Noe, why is it Noah in the same New Testament? Okay, this is empirical evidence. All right, now in your, in your hand, if you have these two Bibles, you can see one King James says Noah, one says Noe. Now here's my point. We're all in the same room and we're all seeing the exact same change. So to some degree, there is absolutes. We are sharing the same reality. At least that's what we're perceiving. Would you all agree with that? Okay, it seems like it. All right, now I know this is a tough crowd for what I'm about to do because I, I understand, I learned a lot yesterday, okay? 
And so I'm going to try to phrase my questions in such a way that I'm very narrow in my questioning because I'm trying to get a, uh, a process for those who are not where we're at, right? Okay, I'm trying to help people because I believe they're deceived, don't you? Do you believe if you think this is all misremembering that they're deceived and you aren't? They're waking yeah. up. They're waking up, thank you. That's a more empowering term, okay. So I want to help people because Aristotle said uh, the mark of an educated man is the ability to consider a matter without embracing it. So that's all I'm asking. But what we've found in seven years is they're re re recalcitrant, they're adversarial, they're vitriolic. They won't even come out and talk to us. So that's not good behavior, right? All right, so I found out that they don't know because they don't want to know. Well, why don't they want to know? Well, there's two reasons that pastors don't want to know. One is the rich young ruler principle, and the other is that they don't believe the Bible can change. Okay? There's about four or five passages like, uh, thy word is forever settled in heaven, is what it says. Now, does that mean that the Bible can't change? Because what happened with us, oops, sorry, I always felt the same thing, because that's what we've been told. Well, when it started changing, I had to say to myself, well, if it's changing, then it must not be teaching that it can't change. So I went back in with new eyes, and I started to look at what it was really saying. Well, thy word is forever settled in heaven. I realized, well, maybe there's a distinction between the term word of God and the term scripture. Maybe they're not the same thing. Well, that's exactly what we found. So I'm going to tell you what I believe is what's going on with, as far as where the Bible is. Okay? So God gave his message to humanity through these chosen men. Right? We call those the original autographs. That was inspired. You have, at one level, Moses getting the Ten Commandments. That's about the highest level picture of revelation that we see. Then you have that narration, like the book of Genesis just opens up. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Well, we, that's John. We, we believe that's inspired. And then you have people like Isaiah. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, and then everything after that we accept as the word of God. It's God's thoughts, basically. Okay? But then you have Paul telling Timothy, hey, when you're in Troas, bring my jacket with you. Is that the word of God? It's scripture, okay? So scripture contains the words of God. I think that's more accurate. I think the church has been sloppy with their definitions, and it's gotten them into trouble because they believe there's a force field around the Bible, and it's impervious to an attack like this. But I'm sorry, your doctrine's wrong. So they're basically taking these passages that speak about the preservation of what God said and then they're attributing it to the book, which is terrestrial. The word is up here. Okay, so if tomorrow the, 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 uh, the sixth commandment, thou shall not murder, now says thou shall not eat ice cream cones. Okay? <laughs> does, does that mean that you now can murder? No. No, the, the moral imperative is still in effect. And because it's become inaccessible to humanity, that doesn't mean that the law of God is no longer in appliance. So you have the, the pagan in the jungle who's never heard the gospel. He's still accountable to the threatenings of God. So that's what we believe, OK? So I just want to lay that foundation. All right, so how much time do I have, by the way, so I can tailor this? I have till the top of the hour. Is that right? All right, so I started going down this road of how to get the unconvinced not to be convinced, but to agree with me through questions. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin to give you questions, and I'm going to ask you to answer. And begin, remember to condescend to the lowly. Don't be too evasive and too fancy, OK? And be, understand that not everybody is where you are when, they're, when we're dealing with these topics. All right, so the first one is, in the Bible, God commands us to remember uh, eight different times we're commanded to remember. Thou shalt remember the Lord their God and his commandments, right? So my question to you is if God is commanding us to remember, would you agree that that would seem to indicate that our memory would have to be 
pretty reliable over long periods of time. If God's commanding you to remember, he wouldn't really command us to do something we weren't able to do, right? I command you to fly around the room. Now, if he allowed us to fly around the room, then it would be okay. But if we can't, that would be immoral. God would be conflicted. Would you agree with that? Yes. That's a reasonable perception. So here they are. He's commanding us to remember. So let's do it real simple. Do you believe that if God commands us to remember, that that would indicate that the human memory would have to be very reliable for him to do that? Yes or no? If you say yes, raise your hand. Da, 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 Do you know what just happened? Their entire basis of their argument just collapsed at their feet. Didn't it? What is their argument? You're just misremembering. Why? You can't trust the human memory, John. It's so unreliable. What did they just say? The memory is very reliable, John. Oh, thank you. OK? Now, let me reinforce that with another question. Now, let's say you go visit your aging parent. They have no missed history of mental illness. And they, they are not on any controlled substances. They don't have a demon. There's nothing outside of the norm. And you go there, and they go, who are you? OK, they don't recognize their own child. Now, the goal of this is to try to extract your expectation of how reliable the human memory is. What is your expectation? Based on all of your experience. So if that happened, what conclusion would you draw? Why, why do you believe your own parent wouldn't recognize you? Anybody? Dementia. Dementia. Does everybody agree that that's a reasonable conclusion? OK. Now, my question is, why do you come to that conclusion? Because that's one of the symptoms of dementia. It's one of the symptoms of dementia, which is what? Memory loss. Memory loss. OK, but if I go to the Christmas party and I say, hey, Joe, and he goes, no, my name's Jim. I go, oh, yeah, Jim. Would you think I had dementia? No. OK, so what's the difference Part between those two? Age. Okay, you're not a parent, so what does that mean? We're getting there. That means you're more likely to remember Yes. Familial. Why? You have a long history with them. Okay, but what does that mean? You've created more memories. Right? What does that mean? What, what, what type of memory would you have? Would it be vague or would it be vivid? Very vivid. Boom! Okay, so watch what just happened. 100% of people will tell you, oh, if your parent doesn't recognize you, they probably have dementia. What did they just admit to? They admitted that in their opinion, the human memory is extremely reliable when it comes to vivid memories. Yes. Isn't that what they just admitted? Yep. Well, it turns out, <clears throat> whoops, I went the wrong way, my apologies. It turns out that long-term studies support this, 90% accurate after 15 years, and um, 70% accurate after 48 years, but look at this. The U.S. National Library of Medicine says it is generally assumed that memory is highly accurate and largely indelible, at least in the case of strong memories. So what does that mean? That means that now I've gotten this person with two questions to agree that the human memory is reliable because God commanded us, he wouldn't do that, and because mommy would recognize me. If she doesn't, it's not misremembering. Okay? Now, let me do one more example to illustrate the importance. And by the way, this script is on my website at wakeuporelse.com. Go to the resources tab, and this is right at the top of that list. You can download this script, and then you can use this with anybody you want. All right, so, yes, you've got a guy, a couple that lives in suburbia, Bill and Mary, and they live next door to Joe, okay, and then down the street is Jim, two doors down. So Bill and Mary live in suburbia for 20 years, and they've lived next door neighbor to Joe, but down the street is Jim. Okay, now duplicate that 100 times in 100 neighborhoods, so it's a test case. So you've got 100 examples of that in 100 neighborhoods. Now my question is, out of the 100, how many of them do you believe 
would be mixed up and they'd be mistaking the next door neighbor for Jim, right? Because it's like the platter's peanut guy. He's got uh, an implanted thought. Out of the hundred, how many do you believe would be befuddled? Would it be all of them? No. How about 50%? No. All right. Now, I'll, I won't put words in your mouth anymore. Anybody want to tell me what your expectation is? How many do you think would get it, be confused? Zero. So what does that tell us? What that tells us is that all of humanity, all of recorded history, has come to a conclusion that the human memory, at least in the case of vivid memories, is highly accurate. Jordan fades back. Swish. <laughs> Are you loving this? I mean, this is like huge for me. This is humongous. All right, now. Now, what happens then is now they're trying to figure their escape route. They're trying to figure out how they're going to respond to this. And so we're going to go to the phenomenon question. All right, so I'm going to give you another example. Let's say your name is Joe, and you wake up one morning, and your name is Jim. And all of your bank statements say it's Jim, and everybody knows you as Jim. So you go to the doctor and you get checked out and you find your, there's no mental illness. You go to your spiritual leader and there's no demon, okay? So everything's normal. Would you, would you consider that experience a phenomenon, yes or no? Yes. Because why? Because human beings are given the faculty of certainty, right? I don't care what the data sphere says. I know what my name is, bro, right? <laughs> right? We have this certain emotional state called certainty. We're, we're not moved by outward input. Okay, so now I'm talking to Pastor Schmo here, right? I'm saying, okay, Pastor, well, you testified that, you know, um, oh, what I'm going to ask him next is I'm going to say, okay, can you quote a scripture from memory? And he's going to say, well, of course. And um, let's use Jesus wept as an example. Jesus wept. It's in every translation. Pastor, how certain are you that you got that right? What's he going to say? 100%. 100%. He's going to say, I'm 100% certain. So here's the, here's the absolute closer, OK? <laughs> Pastor, is your level of certainty about the fact that your name changed in my example? You wake up and your name is different. Is it at the same level of certainty as the scripture is correct if you open the Bible? And they say yes. So what did I just do? I just got them to agree that the experience that we're testifying to, that our Bible's changing or our reality's changing, is a phenomenon. Because it's all about certainty. This entire argument is about the level of certainty that we have, is it not? Yeah. In our experience. But getting them to agree to that has been impossible. I don't know about you guys, but it's yeah. like pulling teeth. <laughs> They'd, it's like... Um, uh, it's easier to deceive someone than to convince them they've been deceived, right? A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So by, tr by turning it into questions, we're drawing them out. And now I, I'm almost done at this point. Okay, my next question is, all right, well, if you agree that the human memory is extremely reliable and you agree that the experience that we're testifying to is not misremembering, but it's a phenomenon, my final question is, please explain how the phenomenon works. Because what I'm told all the time is, you're delusional. Have you ever been told that? Yes. Yeah. But did they ever tell you how you're delusional? No. 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 They'll tell you, this is a satanic psyop. That's what one of the people we're going to have on on my channel to have a discussion. We have discussions with pastors now, and then we have debates with the guys that want to assign us to the seventh circle of hell because we're dividing the body of Christ, right? <laughs> we have a moderator for those guys, OK? Because otherwise, it doesn't go very well, OK? So, so now I'm going to put you in a corner, OK? I'm going to be like, you know, you're telling me we're crazy and irrational and we can't be reasoned with, but I'm, I, I think I sound pretty cogent. I'm just going by observations I'm making here. So you're agreeing that it's a, it's a phenomenon. So how does the phenomenon work? And I'll help you, OK? Because the only two ways that I can envision what we're experiencing as a phenomenon is 
either I'm looking at the Bible, and the lion and the lamb is a famous one, right? Everybody remembers it. I'm looking at the page, and it actually says lion, but I'm seeing wolf. So that's psychosis. That is, I'm seeing pink elephants, <laughs> right? Seeing things that are not there is a psychosis. Well, they don't want that because guess what? They remember lion, they remember mirror, mirror, so they're in the same boat if they go that route, right? They don't want to admit that they're having psychosis. Well, what's the only other option? The only option is that the material thing in front of me has morphed. Our, our reality is morphed. Or I'm sure this crowd could come up with some other options, which I'd love to hear. Other than those two things, I'm either seeing things that aren't there, thank you, or I'm right and it has changed. Pastor, which one is it? You know what's going to happen? They're going to freak out and hang up. They're going to run away because they don't have an answer, and very few of them are going to repent because that's what we found. They don't know, and they don't want to know. But I'm going out to the entire body of Christ with this conversation because for seven years, we have tried to get them to come out and have an intelligent discourse with us, and they have been like vipers. They cut us off. They call us crazy. They call us everything you guys have experienced, but worse, because now you're dealing with their, their whole kingdom, okay? The kingdom is threatened. And it's not just their financial security. It's the perception that if, we, if this is happening, instantly they think, well, God's a liar. Right? If God promised the Bible wouldn't change and it's changing, then God's a liar. So they get really triggered, like zero to 60. So I try to de-escalate them when I start out. I'll say, look, what I'm going to share with you is going to be very difficult for you to receive because you're going to believe that what I'm suggesting is that the divine perfections of God have been compromised by this. But I can assure you that God is not a liar. First of all, he told us this was going to happen. In Daniel 7.25, it says, speaking of the Antichrist, he will seek to change times and laws. Well, that word laws is translated as the law of God in Ezra 7, so it's a fair interpretation to suggest that that's telling us in the future when the Antichrist comes on the scene, which is now, that he will be able to fiddle with the space-time continuum and the Bible. Couldn't be any clearer. I love Enoch, though, okay, because Enoch chapter 80, verse 2. You ready? In that day, all things on the earth will alter, and they will be out of their time. Could that not be more accurate description of the Mandela effect? Wow. Wow. Now, verse 3, chapter 80, he says, the fruits of the earth will be backwards. Okay, and we have now, okay, here's Enoch. Okay, all things on the earth will alter and shall not appear in their time. And the rain will be kept back, and all the heavens shall withhold. And in those times, the fruits of the earth will be backwards. Okay. Anybody uh, resonate with that or not? Okay. Here's residual evidence from a documentary about Cuba. This is bananas on the dock. And one guy said, well, they're just hanging them upside down, John. Okay, whatever. That's my response to that. Okay, but then Enoch goes and hits another home run. It's a trifecta in this Chapter 80, he says, and the moon shall al alter her order and not appear at her time. What? Whoa. What? Oh, Enoch, I love you, baby. Waxing crescent, yes. waning crescent. This is what I took a picture of in my backyard. <laughs> Enoch, doot doot, Enoch. <laughs> Enoch is rocking your world, baby. Unbelievable. There it is. So this is, this is uh, super validity, right? OK, so Amos chapter 8 is a big one for us. God said, I'm going to send a famine in the last days, but not a famine of bread. It's going to be a famine of the word. Men will seek the word and will not find it. They'll look for the north and the south, the east and the west. So it's not regional. It's all over. How could that possibly happen in modernity? No way. You couldn't have the, we have the flash drives, we have the Bible hidden everywhere, it's, there's no way. So the Mandela effect perfectly fulfills the Amos 8 prophecy, doesn't it? 
they won't be able to find it because it's going to get watered down, watered down, watered down, and eventually it'll just be whatever. I don't know. And then, of course, in Revelation 22, it says this, seal not the words of the prophecy. Now, that word seal is a word that means a mark as to protect from Satan. So now, and then it says not after that. So let me trans transliterate that for you. Seal not the words of the prophecy. A mark as to protect from Satan, not the Bible. Don't protect the Bible from Satan. Okay, that's what it says. So now in Daniel 12, you've got these words that say, seal up the words until the time of the end. Then on the back side, you have, okay, time's up. Stop protecting it. It's right there in the Bible. <laughs> but when we show them these things, they just goes, blink, <laughs> because they don't want it to be true. And it's wicked. So I would ask you all, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I would ask you to, to I'm sorry about that. Last year, I did talk every Sunday to the community, you know, how to walk through this when your spouse turns on you. My son doesn't talk to me now. My daughters are hanging on by a thread. My wife and I have a great relationship. She might be coming around. We still love each other. But she's a normie, right? And I, what I found is that when two people are in a marriage and one is a normie and one's a truther, it becomes vacuous. It's very, very difficult. This is what the book is about that I wrote. The book is called uh, The Conspiracy Theorist Survival Guide. Whoever sits in the front row very often gets the winners. Yeah. Boom. Thank awesome. you. Okay, it's a guidebook for persecuted truthers. So you go, to, you go to Amazon, there's two types of books. One is trying to tell you we're all crazy, right? And then the other 50% is trying to convince you that these things are real. Well, we already know it's real, and we know we're not crazy. So none of the books are for us. So this is for the truther. This is for your journey. An emotional, spiritual, intellectual guidebook on how to deal with the... It's like a book for your soul. It's not how... You know, how to know the moon landing is faked. You know, it's not one of those books, okay? So, <clears throat> am I good to one? Is that right? I guess you're right here, Bob. Thank you. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish my interaction with the church leader by saying this. So, what's your answer? Do you, could you explain how the phenomenon works? And they're not going to have an answer. Is my mic still on? Yeah. Okay. And I don't know what they're going to do. They're going to hang up. They're going to freak out. But I'm going to say, look, they're going to say, I don't have an answer. You're just deluded. OK. Well, what Sherlock Holmes said is, if you've eliminated all of the suspects, <clears throat> the only one left, no matter how unlikely, is the murderer. If you don't have an answer for us, then the only possible answer is that the Bible is changing. And we'll see what happens. Um, we've got. One of my team members here, my good friend Mark, is here, and he and I are working together. We're reaching out to pastors. We're inviting them to come on the channel, and we're going to be having either a civil discussion for those who aren't vitriolic, but then there's those that are, and we'll have a debate. And when I walk them down this path, it's not going to go well for them, because as I demonstrated here, the logic is searing. I mean, there's no escape. And I don't know what they're going to do. It's going to be really interesting to watch, though. So. Subscribe to the channel so when we start doing these, um, you'll be able to see those happen. All right, so I'm going to take questions. All I right, can. ladies and gentlemen, John Kerwin. Thank you yes. so much, John. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Bob. So if you have questions for John, you don't need to raise your hand. We're not in school. Come on over to the microphone. We would love to hear you. Line up over here uh, one by one. We'll get you in order that you line up. Uh, yeah, these folks, I'm sure, will be glad to, to give their seats up for a moment. Let's just sit down. Uh, so uh, great conversation, John. Thank you. I do have a question. Yes. Um, not for you, actually. Mm. For the crowd. Volunteers and speakers are not allowed to answer the question. The lion shall lie down with the lamb. Just shout it out. What Bible verse is it? I'm sorry, what? Isaiah 11.6. Are you a speaker? Yes. Try again. 
I was trying to get somebody who doesn't already have one of the goodies. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. I said it was six. <laughs> <laughs> we have a winner. <laughs> right on. Excellent. He knows how to get the goodies, man. That's hilarious. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. I do have some goodies to give out throughout the conference. I've been waiting on a moment here. Yeah! <laughs> Way to go. Congratulations. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and one more question. One more. This is a little harder. Yes. You mentioned the same question for you, so please don't answer it. Okay. These are not for speaker and volunteers either. You mentioned a Bible verse uh, right towards the end, uh, a very special verse about the knowledge being lost. What Bible verse was that, folks? Which one was that? The one um, about the knowledge. A, a lack of knowledge. Can't find the knowledge. Oh, Okay. Who was taking notes? Who knows what Bible verse that was? My, do you mean my blank? It starts with an A. I'll give you that. What is it? Oh, the, the, the name of the book where, where yeah, yeah, yeah. the famine will come. Yes, yes, the okay. famine will come. The famine of the word, yes. Okay, what book was that in? The book, not the verse. The I'll take the book at this point. Oh, this is to see if you're paying attention, I guess. No, ma'am. I'm sorry, who, who said it? Amos. Amos, that's it, right here. There we are. Correct. Excellent. Thank you so call. much. <laughs> that one was a little bit harder. There we go. Nice. Uh, you earned the prizes around here. That's right. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your patience. Our first question is up. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Oh, hi, John. Hi. Great talk. I love to hear you talk a little bit, if you would, about the Word of God, because I know you've got some thoughts on that, and I really would love to hear just a summary of these changes in the Bible, and what does it mean? How, how can we look at the Word of God? Um, just your thoughts on that area, that topic. Just state it one more time, so okay. I'm getting um, your answer. Yeah, what is the Word of God? When we think right. of in terms of the Mandela effect, the Bible changes, Yes. how can we... Um, yeah best see this in a way that makes sense of the Mandela effect, the Bible changes, and our perception of what does that mean? You know? Okay. All right. And it's sort of like a great question, central question. Thanks. It's very similar to what I said about this phenomenon. It, I know what it, I know, I don't know what it is, but I know what it isn't. It's not misremembering, right? So what is the word? I know what I don't know what it is, but I know what it isn't. It isn't the scriptures. Okay? So the, the baseline scripture for where, what the word of God is, is the Gospel of John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then verse 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, that's Jesus. So what my Bible is telling me is Jesus is the word. Now, what that really means is like it'll take all of eternity to unfold that revelation. But here's how you know that the term word and the term scripture are not the same. Okay? If they are interchangeable, then I should be able to put scripture into that same passage. So listen to this. In the beginning was the scripture, and the scripture was with God, and the scripture was God. Doesn't that fall to the ground? Yeah. That re doesn't resonate, right? It doesn't make sense because what the word is is a person. The word is Jesus, right? So what does that mean? This event is a judgment, and judgment begins with the house of God. And what's happened is we've replaced a relationship with him with head knowledge. That's just what the Pharisees did. They couldn't recognize God when they were standing right in front of them because they had all this head knowledge about God, but here's God trying to win them over, and they're like, get out of here. We're going to kill you. So what we've done, and all of us are guilty of this, sorry, is we have problems, right? And so what I think is the reason I have problems is I don't have enough information. So I started to go to the Bible as a self-help book to fix my problems. And we become full of knowledge and then no, no relationship because the Bible isn't really... Uh, 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 you know, um, um, an owner's manual tech book. It's a, it's a doorway to him. It's a prayer guide, right? Yes. And that's what the church has missed. They, they have the word now being removed 
So it's what happened with Jesus in reverse. Pharisees didn't recognize him, and now the church is not recognizing that he's no longer there. Because the things that are in there, I didn't get into it, but there's graphic sexual innuendo, biblical paradoxes. You can sacrifice turtles to God. Two men in a bed. Men are breastfeeding. Jesus has female breasts. Okay, in the Bible. When I can't tell pastors this in the, up front because they'll hang up on me. You're a blasphemer. That's not in my Bible. Well, why don't you open it up and I'll show not you. Not the best Clay. way to lead, right? No. So it's so outrageous what's in there that they are going down the path to when the AC comes on the scene, the Antichrist, everything about him is going to be in the book. And that's where we see this thing where it says even the very elect will be deceived. We're actually watching that happen right now. It's happening. Unbelievable. Thank you for a great question. Did that answer your question, Cynthia? Oh, my gosh, yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Next question. <laughs> Coming to the mic, At it round is. round two. Okay, now, if there's <laughs> one thing I've learned about this conference already, you can guarantee every person, this man's got a question. I love that. Love you're that. paying attention, you're taking notes. Ted, go ahead. If you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. And so the cool part is, is we all have a personal remembrance. I'm going to get to my question. Um, but I, I want to talk about John 1-1, because for me, it was one of the best parts that introduced me to the Mandela effect, because for me, that never said that. Every single time I memorized it, every single time I read it, because I could, you know, quote it. And it was like, in the beginning, you know, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was good. That's the way I remember it. Really? Yeah, there was an extra O in there, and the Word was good. Wow. When it changed to God, when it changed to God for me, I was like, is the Word not good anymore? Is it not good anymore? And it scared me. It really did. It messed with me. Like, this is, supposed to, this is the way that I would talk to people about. This is the good Word. It's good, and it's amazing, and it's built for you. So when that changed, I'm like, something is wrong, and something is different. My question for you actually comes out of another part of John, John 14, 2, right? In my house are many mansions, right? And the reason that I ask that is, like, when we talk about coming into here and we're sharing a universe, yes. I'm wondering sometimes, are we sharing or are we bringing an entire universe with us and mixing that? Like, I'm mixing my universe with yours. I get to see your universe, and you get to see mine. Do you think that that's possible, or do I have to conform to a universe that we're, you know, in the beginning, it's God is the word, and the word is not good? You see what I'm saying? It's like, the question that I have is if it changes, which one is the best one? Like, uh, we've all asked this question ever since we were born. We're like, so is it the Bible? Is it the Quran? Is it the Torah? I wonder sometimes is with our loss of the ability to spell because we're always relying on spell check and fulfilling all these things that we're removing some of the greatest craftsmanship that has ever existed. And that is the ability to create word from the ground up. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, my question is to you is like with the loss of this ability, just like see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. When you minus one sense out, a new sense appears. Are we, are we gaining a new sense to see new perceptions and new universes, and we're accepting the idea to have many mansions that are available now that weren't available earlier? Did you guys understand the question? Because I'm sorry, yeah, but I don't no. understand what you're asking me. Are we open to new perceptions? Can we be open to new perceptions? Ooh. Who is we? Are you talking? Uh, yeah, you're asking yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. I'm asking you. I'm asking you. Well, that's and, not what you said. Yeah. You asked. You said, "Are we open?" No. Are you asking me? Like, if I'm my open? Perc my perception of the Mandela effect yep. is mine, and I know I'm rare, and I know I'm different because a lot of people don't think like that, and a lot of people call me crazy, and I'm wondering, is there a place for my perception? Should I continue to believe that? Like you continue to believe that this is different, and you say, "No, I'm not going to believe that anymore because I know what was written." But yeah. from my perspective, I felt like I know what was written. Can there be a world where both of our perceptions exist, is my question. And you're asking me that? Yes. OK. So my answer is this. In, in my belief system, there are absolutes. There's right and wrong, yes and no, black and white. The Ten Commandments are not the Ten Suggestions. It's God's universe. He created it. And you are living in his universe. All of the laws are his laws. And the Bible doesn't make any apologies for what it claims on man. Because God has this funny feeling. He created you in the womb, and he feels like he has a, uh, a claim on you. And there's going to be a judgment day. And then, and then it, it doesn't really answer all your questions. 
And so then you have to either decide to accept it or not. My prayer every day to God is, God, I accept your terms. So God can be known, but he can't be understood. Okay, so my response to you is, you could do whatever you want, okay? But there's, to me, there's two kinds of people in the world. People that have decided to believe the teachings of Scripture and those who reject it. That's my answer. Thank you so much for that answer. It's, it produces freedom. Thank you. Awesome. And thank you, sir. We appreciate it. All right, next up, our fellow board member, Chris. What do you got for him, Chris? I can't wait to hear this one. Hi, John. I really appreciated what you, ha what you had to say throughout the whole, your whole presentation. So I have a comment and a question. Excellent. The comment is about fruit. So in the book of Enoch, it talked about how the fruit will be reversed. Yes. You showed the picture of the bananas. And then and I, in my presentation, there's a synchronicity where I was talking about fruit. A fruit loop cereal change yep. and then fruit of the loom in the cornucopia it seems like fruit is for me starting to become a little bit of a pattern and of course the way i interpreted the the new spelling of it f-r-o-o-t mm -hmm. was a frequency repeat of original timeline like that. loop yes that's a little bit different so i just wanted to to mention that um regarding the whole fruit concept the other thing the question i wanted to ask you though is about the book of enoch because I grew up in a very religious household, right. and the Book of Enoch was not something that was ever spoken about. I wanted to know your opinion of the Book of Enoch. There seems question. to be some pretty interesting things there. Great question. It's very weird how church, church, churchianity, Christ, you know, uh, reacts whenever you invoke the term Enoch. Oh my gosh, that wasn't in the canon. You can't talk about him. Be quiet. <laughs> so, you know, we know that Enoch was a patriarch in the Bible. And he was only one of two guys that ever got translated. The Bible says he walked with God and then was not. So this dude has some creds, okay? He was so tight with God, God was like, I can't take this guy anymore. And he didn't die. The only other guy that did that was Elijah. Elijah got caught up on a fiery chariot, right? Secondly, Jude quotes Enoch verbatim. Jude, which is canonized, quotes Enoch in his Bible. So that means it's at least a spiritual, it's a prophetic book, because otherwise Jews not going to put it in there. And the Ethiopian Bible has Enoch in it. And we're pretty confident that the Catholic Church came in and So there's some duplicity in the actual canon, right? Um, and so, you know, what it says in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, hey, Enoch, this thing I'm going to give you, it's not for you. It's for those that will live in the last days. So I think it's been censored, personally. And you read, it's a tough read. It's all about this really esoteric, a lot of angel stuff, a lot of judgment stuff. It's really hard to read. But as you can see, it's quite relevant for the hour that we're in. I mean, this is bombshell to me. This is like, pfft. case closed. Perry Mason's here, boom, you're done. This is like, forget <laughs> about it, right? So. Um, and did that answer your question? Like, how does it reconcile with the Bible, right? Yeah, is, is it something worth reading and considering? Oh, gaining knowledge from the secrets? Definitely. Of I mean, the Bible says, is it not written in the book of Jasher? That's in the book of Judges. Well, what does that mean? The Holy Spirit inspired the writer of Judges to reference this extra biblical text as a, as a credibility book. Hey, isn't it written in the book of Jasher? Well, what does that mean? The book of Jasher must have some creds, right? So. The church has these lines that they've drawn, and they don't tarry outside that. But in this hour, I mean, I'm forced to rethink everything I've believed. The Bible's changing, bro. I'm like, this is new territory. We don't know. I call it a heresy hurricane. That we're in. <laughs> it's like we are in new territory. And, we, and so this is why God is doing this, though. God is taking our little training wheels away. Right? He's forcing us to call out to him. He's testing the church and saying, do you know the book or do you know me? And that's where Enoch takes us. Enoch takes us into realms of glory and the whole experiential part. Because a lot of the church is just like this cerebral, robotic, they, you know, pastors have just become lawyers, you know, and they're just, bam, 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 you violated this, 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 and this. And you're like, <laughs> I don't know. What about the thief on the cross? He didn't know nothing, man. <laughs> thief on the cross was like, hey, you're awesome. Aren't you? you don't belong here, man. Hey, remember me. Boom. 
He was translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light with one statement. So all this theology, and you're not properly exegeting the word, you're taking it out of context and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you just are dead. Your, your, your religion is dead. The letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. So this is a blessing. It's what's called a redemptive judgment. Okay, it's judgment, but it's to win you back. Like, you know, you might give your kid a little swa. It's not because you hate him or you're an ogre. It's because you want to impress upon him the importance of changing your path. So God's trying to win us back and showing us uh, you've gotten off the path, and I hope it'll turn out well. But <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> I'm not too sure sometimes. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe with the fruit thing, you're telling me we're all fruit loops, right? And by the way, I just wanted to mention, I do meet a now. lot of people. I don't really have this sensitivity, but your, your prophetic edge where you're able to discern like the underlying meanings of the changes is really cool. Like I know people that uh, they're reading because it's definitely in there. It's like written into the code. Like the change has, is not just random. So all those prophetic insights are relevant. There's a lot of, to be learned from that. Did that answer your question, sir? Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. I'd love to talk to you later about Bible code, too, Please. In, rela in relation Bible to Bible code Bible is changes. amazing. amazing. <laughs> Go Elaine. ahead. You're next up, Miss Elaine. Elaine's my new friend. Okay. <laughs> well, first of all, let me apologize for any language that I may have used in our discussions. You never said you were a pastor. Oh, well, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> When uh, you said that, I was like, oh, my God. Well, you're apologizing to the wrong guy. Okay, well, I I'm never used to say anything. I'm an equal opportunity Christian. So I'm so glad to have a pastor to drill for just a minute. Cool, go for it. I grew up mostly in Arkansas, so it's pretty mandatory that you do attend church. Yes. Uh, and um, so I did go to a lot of church and always saw the hypocrisy there and got out of there as fast as I could. Um, never understood the Bible until the awakening a few years ago and I was driven to start reading the Bible and for the first time it became a storybook mm. for me and number one have you noticed the change in the Lord's Prayer oh yeah because I can't even remember now what the original was from trespasses to debts right because we've said it so long both ways that I don't even remember which yeah. way it started but I know it changed and also um, the pouring new wine into bottles um, ridiculous was like was earth shattering for me when I read that right because I hadn't heard of any Mandela effects in the Bible personally although I knew the Lord's Prayer w was weird yeah. but when I wore, read that about pouring it into bottles my mind I just sat there and looked at the word bottles and went they did not have glass bottles in biblical days right so that shattered my reality bad. I mean, it, it, I so had. But you were convinced, in other words. Uh, oh, I knew, uh, yes. but I thought if the, if the Bible could change, what can't be changed in my, my world? Um, but what I want to ask is about Enoch, yeah. because my church, none of the churches I went to ever discussed Enoch. Yes, we, it's off limits. They discussed very little, actually, about Bible at all. But um, what are your thoughts about UFOs in Enoch? Okay, excellent question. Because I never, ever, ever saw it like that before. Mm -hmm. But when I went back and read it, it became so obvious to me that there were spacecrafts yep. happening in biblical days. And you talk about mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. Preachers right. aren't talking that. So I would like a pastor's thoughts on the UFO in, Great in Enoch. Excellent question. So uh, again, I, I enjoy the luxury of not having to tell you what I believe. I base my life and what I believe on the Bible. When I came to God, I said, whatever I've believed up to this point, if I find something in here which counteracts what I believe, I'm going to reject what I've believed and I'm going to believe that. That's the way I live my life. All right, so what, I'm, what I learn in the Bible is that there's really God and the Satan. There's just those two entities, and they're sort of at war. You know, chapter, Job chapter 1, Satan comes before God, and God strikes up this conversation, and they're having this brawl, right? So they're brawling. God is brawling. The, you know, and the angels are brawling, the devil's angels. And so um, the biblical worldview of 
of aliens is that they're not from Alpha Centauri or whatever. They're dimension interdimensional. They're, they're an aspect of the fallen ones. We don't really completely get all the data on who they are and where they are. are the, some of them are locked up in Tartarus. Some of them are up the spirits of the powers of the air. Uh, you know, the greys, we believe, are uh, clones that they have to function in the natural realm. Some are, are physical fallen angels. The demons, it's pretty clear, are the offspring of the uh, Genesis chapter 6. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair, and they made it, and they gave birth to giants. Those giants died, and their spirits are what, where demons come from. We're pretty confident that that's, we don't know everything, though, you know? So, uh, but when it comes to that, do they have physical spaceship? I'm like, do they have like a factory somewhere in the Antarctic or something where they're actually making spaceships? I mean, I don't know. Because I have a buddy who's a commercial air, airline, uh, commercial helicopter pilot. He just told me he was flying and he looked over here and there was a jet that was chemtrailing, for sure. He was close to it. And he prayed under his breath because his guy next to him wasn't a believer. And he, he said, in the name of Jesus, I bind that demonic thing. And as soon as he prayed that prayer, the thing went opaque, like he could see through it. And it went, Pew! it sped off at like Mach 20. Now, that was a firsthand testimony I just got from a guy that saw it firsthand. So what does that mean? The things that we're seeing in the sky, in the, at least in some cases, are not physical or at least how we would understand it, right? So you're seeing a narrative played out in the superhero movies, and all the movies are like the angels, or the, the aliens came here long ago and seeded the planet, and they're coming back as the vibration comes up to rescue us, and there's good aliens and bad aliens. And my opinion, based on my biblical studies and the studies of civilizations and all that, is that that's all a narrative to get you to reject the biblical worldview, which is God created you. All right. Well, I thought we were on a time crunch, but it looks like we have time for just one more question. I do apologize. Not a so problem. So actually, our next up was okay. Soul okay. Spa. Do you wanna, do you wanna was it? Oh, were it's you up on to you. Yeah, she was sitting back here quietly, patiently waiting. I'll be really quick. And I'll give short answers. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say um, you've been amazing, by the way. I find you to be the Seinfeld of metaphysics. Absolutely. <laughs> I get that a lot. Same voice, same wit, everything. Amazing. Okay. Um, I can relate as an empath and a, as a leader in the expanding consciousness movement of I'm trying to help via YouTube. I have to advertise over people I've already known. And as an empath, it's very frustrating to deal with, as you call the normies, right? It's like Mandela effect wise, even the peanut monopoly guy example, it's like one's a peanut, one's a vertically challenged human. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like in New York, like for f like, it's like, you've gotta be fucking kidding me, right? Uh, right? I could tell you're from New York, right? By the way, before you told me you were from New York. Yeah, I'm trying uh, to outgrow it, but you know. I'm from New York. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So we speak the same. Yeah. But um, this question is for so many empaths out there as well, and pr probably for everybody in here. I've interviewed also many NDEers, and they also encounter getting divorced yeah. when they come back as a result of expanded consciousness. And they're yeah. my question for everybody, I feel, is I even have a, now currently I have a roommate and a partner, not only is he a normie, he's a super normie. Super normie. He would have had an answer to all of your questions yeah. that you'd want to go real New York on, right? Yeah. How do we deal? How do we deal? How do we stay loyal to our soul mission? How do we keep leading the, the edge of truth when as empaths we probably feel the, the waves of resistance as a result of the ones that, for whatever reason, don't want to know? No question. Excellent question. This comes up a lot. I'm told all the time, John, only people that God wants to see will see. I got that today, OK? And so my response is, all right, well, if you think, of, can you apply that same logic to evangelizing the lost? No. 
you're told, go preach the gospel to them. The, the apostles, the, all the uh, patriarchs, and Jesus, they warned and they told, repent, the kingdom of heaven. They didn't really care about the response and how it made you feel, right? So, but to answer your question directly, it depends on you, okay? Because, like, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more, and based on your character and your experiences, you might get the same result. Like, I had two salespeople once, and one girl would call the company owner and be like, hi, how are you? The weather's great today. And it made me nervous, because I'm like, get to the point, okay? She closed three times as many appointments as the other person that got right to the point. So the way you do it might be different than the way I do it, okay? But what I've shared today, I believe, is a magic wand. Okay, it's if you're going to engage someone in an intelligent discourse to share different ideas, the best way to draw them out is to get them to admit what you're saying is right, not convince them. So these questions, which are on wakeuporelse.com, the resources tab, top of the first link is the script. And you, know, you might not use all the questions, but they're deadly. I mean, there's like no way out of them, right? Does that answer your question? Yes, brilliant. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, we do have a panel this evening, so do hold your questions. Again, I'm so sorry, Roger. I love you to death, my friend. I know that's twice. <laughs> I'm so very sorry. Thank you, guys. But we do have a panel coming up. Thank you, John. John Kerwin, ladies and gentlemen.